Um, uh, first of all, um, since we last met, Scottish churches are now able to um, open for public worship again from uh, today, from the 15th of uh, July. So we're delighted that Scottish churches now have that opportunity and the guidance for Scottish churches has now been published. And Andy Hunter, our Scotland director, is going to be ru running a webinar on the uh, 21st of July, especially to help uh, churches and leaders in Scotland as they wrestle with the particular regulations that will be Im impacting our, on Scottish churches. So um, uh, we're delighted to be able to do that. Um, we're waiting for the guidance to be published by the Welsh government. So it's still unclear what the situation is in Wales. As soon as we have that guidance available, we'll similarly put together a, 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 a sort of a webinar specifically designed for Welsh churches to deal with the um, guidance that the Welsh government um, produces. So watch out uh, for that if you're ministering uh, in uh, Wales. As I said last week, as um, a senior leadership team of FIEC, we're making ourselves available for church leaders for individual consultations. Um, uh, we've talked uh, generally about guidance and issues for churches. You may have individual issues that you want to talk through with us. You can now book 20 minute uh, time slots with myself or Johnny or Adrian or Andy uh, between now and the 31st of um, July. That's available on the FIEC website if you would like to talk personally and individually about how these issues affect your uh, churches. So we've made that system available. Um, please do take advantage of it. There are a relatively limited number of slots inevitably. Um, we'll be giving priority to FIEC churches and then pastors network members um, who might want um, our, uh, our help. Let me just before I hand over to Steve, bring us very briefly to uh, God's word. I want to take us um, just to a couple of verses in 1 Peter chapter 5. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Um, these verses say this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. I don't know about you, but I think for very many people, uh, this is a time of heightened anxiety. There are many things about which we might feel anxious at this time. Perhaps we feel anxious for ourselves, anxious for our families, anxious for our loved ones. Um, uh, we might feel anxious about our ministry. We might feel anxious about our church and the future. We might feel uh, anxious um, about our job and security. Certainly members of our congregations are feeling all of those uh, anxieties. What is it that's at the root of causing us to feel um, anxious? Well, it seems to me a lot of our anxieties is a result of the fact that we're in a situation in which we are not in control. We can't manage it. We can't sort it. Therefore, we are anxious about it. Um, it's our lack of control, our lack of certainty about the future. And we're in a situation in which we're facing a threat and we all know that there's a danger that it could uh, get worse. And that's a recipe for increased um, anxiety. And it seems to me that um, the Bible recognises that anxiety is part and parcel of life in a fallen world, even life um, uh, as a Christian in uh, a fallen world, as we wrestle with um, that uh, reality. And the Bible um, addresses it and pastorally encourages us that the answer to uh, anxiety is faith, not to simply um, uh, rely on ourselves, but instead to uh, turn uh, to God to uh, carry our anxieties. And that's exactly what Peter says in these um, verses towards the end of his letter. His uh, audience um, are Christians who are facing increasing anxiety because they're finding themselves marginalised within society and they're um, facing the prospect of suffering and persecution. So um, uh, it's quite understandable that they are feeling uh, anxiety. And so he wants to encourage them as to how to deal with that anxiety. And essentially he gives them two comforting truths about God and two actions to take. So the first um, comforting truth about God is that God can uh, lift uh, you up. And that's really um, there in verse six, it says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. And I think the uh, comfort there is God's mighty hand. He reminds them of God's great power, that no matter what happens, no matter what the future might hold, God in his great power is able to uh, lift uh, them up. That may well be um, in this life, in the face of the anxieties and, and pressures they're suffering, but ultimately, of course, that is in um, eternity. God's mighty hand has been nowhere more clearly displayed than in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus which uh, gives rise to the living hope that began the letter. So no matter how big the problems are that we might face and the anxiety that they cause, 
uh, God is bigger. No problem is too big for him. Um, uh, we are under God's mighty uh, hand. He can lift you up. And secondly, the second comforting truth is uh, that God will carry your anxiety. That's really um, verse seven. It's a wonderful picture of casting your anxiety onto God, onto him, because he uh, cares for you. Um, uh, our problem is if we think that we have to carry our anxiety ourselves and we have to deal with it. Very often our anxiety is increased because we take on our old, own shoulders burdens that we should not be bearing. No, instead we're to cast our anxiety onto God and the comforting truth is he cares for you. Um, he wants to take that burden. He wants uh, to uh, carry it. So there are two uh, comforting truths. God can lift you up because he is mighty. God will carry your anxiety because he cares. And it follows from those two, the actions um, uh, that we're to take. And uh, fundamentally, they are actions of trust. So uh, Peter uh, says, first of all, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Essentially, recognize your own weakness. Recognize that it's not a situation you can deal with. It's not in your control. You don't have the power. Our anxiety often comes because of our pride, that we think that we ought to be able to deal with it. Though we're to humble ourselves under his mighty hand, not to lift ourselves up, but so that he lifts us up at the right time. And then, of course, cast uh, all your anxiety on him. A very vivid image of throwing it um, all uh, onto him, taking it off ourselves and, as it were, landing it uh, on him. As I said, actions of trust that we need to take on uh, a daily basis. So the Lord Jesus says each day has enough trouble uh, of its own. Therefore, we need to keep on humbling ourselves and casting our anxiety uh, on him, remembering he's mighty and he cares. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in a time of anxiety, we have these comforting truths of scripture. Thank you that you are a mighty God. Thank you that no matter what problems we face, you are far more powerful than them. And thank you that you are a God who cares for us. You love us. You know the burdens that we bear and you want to uh, carry them uh, on our behalf. So please would you help us to trust uh, you more. May we be those who humble ourselves. May we be those who cast our cares upon you. And we ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm conscious that that's really speaking about a general anxiety. And of course, there's an anxiety that leads to um, uh, mental health issues, which um, are maybe medical, maybe beyond that. So I'm going to hand over to Steve to um, sort of uh, address these issues uh, for us. We're so glad you're here, Steve. Over to you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you for your welcome. Uh, lovely to be with you all. Uh, I feel as though um, there's, there's lots to say on this subject, so I am going to move fairly quickly. Um, forgive me if I gabble on uh, rather rapidly. I think uh, as with previous webinars, the PowerPoint slides will be available afterwards, uh, so you can follow that through. Um, the, we, we have been hearing, haven't we, that, that there is approaching a new wave of, of struggle. We've seen a wave of of COVID infections, and now there is more and more concern about a wave of mental health difficulties. Um, I'm picking up the, the, the anticipation of that in all sorts of levels, speaking to a consultant on intensive care at Addenbrooke's, uh, where they have six people currently uh, suffering from the after effects of serious suicide attempts on intensive care. Uh, consultant psychiatrist anticipating a flood uh, through the summer and the autumn. Uh, needing to cancel leave in, in anticipation of that. H how do we relate to that? Uh, do we want to say, well, look, hang on, we're pastors, not mental health workers. Um, that, that's not, not our chief concern. Um, let me speak into that in two ways. Uh, one comment, practical, one conceptual. Um, if, if we think about a practical comment, well, if, you, if this pyramid represents personal distress, whatever you call it, whether you call it emotional, psychological, uh, relational or indeed spiritual, just call it dis personal distress. You can see that there's a wide, mild end of that distress uh, and a thinner, severe end. Um, but the, the thing about however you measure that distress, if that line at the top represents the little slice that the mental health services um, are able to engage with, it's tiny. The vast majority of people who struggle never get any input from mental health professionals. And that means that they will come looking for help elsewhere. Uh, very often to the church, or perhaps it means that we should go looking for them. Uh, so that's a, that's a sort of practical observation about the impact of, of this increase in, in, in mental health difficulties over the coming time. 
Um, but, but, but let's also think about a, um, a, a kind of a conceptual uh, response to that as well. It's much harder than you think uh, to see where to draw the line between mental health struggles and spiritual struggles. They occupy so much of the same space, like despair and despondency and the desperate need for hope, like guilt and the need to be forgiven, like shame and the need for acceptance, like worthlessness and the need for some kind of purpose, fear and anxiety, the struggle to find someone or something to trust, uh, experiences of failure, repeated habits that are doing so much damage uh, to the person themselves and to others around them. Um, now, to a mental health worker, that sounds like a, a list of things that you can uh, apply to, so, to some diagnosis from psychiatry. Uh, but to, uh, to a pastor, that sounds like the sort of struggles that we have uh, with faith. Um, and I think they are. So I don't think that it's uh, so easy just to be able to sort of divide off and say, uh, there's, um, there's mental health struggles and there's spiritual struggles and they exist in separate categories. I just don't think it's like that. Um, so there's a practical concern, there's, there's a sort of conceptual concern. Uh, last sort of opening comment in relation to this is to say, where is all of this coming from? Um, uh, four things I think uh, occur to me. Uh, the first I think is, is disruption. Uh, disruption to our routines, disruption to established patterns that have so often given us a sense of security and stability. Uh, employment's been disrupted, finances have been disrupted, housing has been disrupted. There is so much uncertainty in our current climate. But the pandemic is not only a disruptor, uh, but it's also an accelerator. Uh, things that were already coming at us uh, are now coming at us faster, whether that's changes in social trends, like working from home, uh, or whether it is um, that the incipient mental health struggles that people were having that are now being accelerated uh, by the pressure uh, of this pandemic. Um, some of that pressure comes from intensification. Um, suddenly you're with family members non-stop uh, and difficult family relationships are no longer being diluted by time away from home. Or you're suddenly alone non-stop. Um, if intense interaction with people is a problem for some, intense loneliness is the issue for others. Um, and, and then finally, uh, would observe uh, that there is an exhaustion that comes from uncertainty. Uh, I don't know whether it's been your experience. I've met lots and lots of people who say they, they just feel inordinately tired at the moment. Uh, and that's been my experience too. Uh, people just feel strangely exhausted. Uh, and as I try to think why, I keep coming back to the issue of uncertainty. And um, previously, uh, we knew what was expected. Uh, we knew what was coming. Uh, and now suddenly we don't. Everything is new. Everything is uncertain. Everything has to be thought through from first principles. Um, and it took me a while to realise it, but, uh, but I soon began to appreciate that it wasn't just screen fatigue uh, that I was experiencing. I was experiencing decision fatigue. Uh, we don't just have all our usual decisions to make, but loads of new decisions as well. Decisions that we often don't feel very well equipped to make, uh, where we don't have enough uh, information, uh, and we're in territory where we don't have the necessary expertise. It's not only that, that we're making um, lots of new decisions, we're also making them from a, a kind of unstable foundation, because things keep moving under our feet. Uh, we're like someone being asked to juggle loads more balls than normal, and then being told to do that, standing on a, on a raft on a choppy sea with waves coming at us that we can't actually see yet. It's exhausting uh, to, to, to need to, to, to live and work in that kind of context. Um, so I think all of those are reasons uh, why uh, many people are struggling. Uh, and some of that struggle is being expressed in emotional, relational and psychological difficulties. So, so what, what are we to do about it? Um, here are some suggestions. Um, my first suggestion would be um, we need to listen more. Uh, I was chatting to somebody the other day and they said one of the things that they've noticed about Zoom is that Zoom is, a, is, a, is, is an environment in which people are kind of lured into making declarations. Um, that, as it were, you don't sort of converse on Zoom, you declare things, you speak out into the void um, and we're all at it. And I thought that was a really good observation. Uh, what does it mean? It means that I don't think we do as much asking on Zoom as we do declaring. 
Um, and I think we need to ask more to find out where people are uh, rather than assume that our experience of lockdown has been the same as their experience of lockdown. Experiences are very different. Last week I was speaking to somebody who's a new grandparent and she's been locked down with her daughter and her brand new grandchild. It's been utter delight. She couldn't think of anything more wonderful than to have these four months with her brand new grandchild. It's like a dream come true. And then I speak to a single mother with two toddlers in a council flat um, with um, no garden, well, not even a, not even a balcony. And it was such a different experience. We need to ask uh, about people's experiences. But, but our asking needs to, as it were, not only um, listen to, to the word said, but try and listen between the lines. I think one of our difficulties in the current context is that we're missing what, I, what I'm sort of calling the on the edge conversations. There's lots of ways that Zoom can, um, can replicate some of our meetings. Um, but they, they, they replicate, as it were, the heart of the meeting. You know, when the small group gets together and does its Bible study and has its sort of group discussion. It can't replicate the on the edge meetings when somebody arrives a little bit early um, and you get a little bit of time to chat or they stay late and you think, oh, I wonder if they wanted to say a little bit more. Or you go out to the kitchen to make a cup of coffee with them. It's those on the edge moments when often somebody says you're right and the other person says no actually i'm really struggling and um, those conversations have disappeared a and we need to find ways of creating alternatives for them uh, ways of, um, of of doing something equivalent and we may need to be imaginative about that um, uh, and we also need to recruit others to do it, not to feel as though we as pastors have to do all of that, but think, how can we help our small group leaders? Uh, and if we're in a, in, a, in a pastoral team, our colleagues and fellow elders, or just pastorally minded church members, and to say, how can you be seeking out um, and asking how people are and pushing a little bit further? And when we do that, I think what we need to be doing is listening for trouble anticipating that because the pandemic is not just a disruptor, but it is also an accelerator, um, people who were struggling to some degree in their relationships may well be struggling hugely. We know people whose marriages have been a bit rocky, uh, people who have um, had some struggles with mental health in the past. We ought to anticipate that it's likely that they're gonna be the people in big trouble now and go seeking them out, find out how they're doing. Um, I think key uh, to be alert to the, to, to the possibility of domestic abuse, to not imagine that our churches will somehow be immune from domestic abuse. I had a funny experience a number of years ago um, where we had no domestic abuse um, in, in our church at all. And then I did a course um, uh, where I was exposed to a lot of teaching about domestic abuse. And the funniest thing happened. Um, that course caused three men to start um, abusing their wives. Very bizarre. Um, why should uh, doing a course suddenly have caused three men to start abusing their wives? Well, of course it didn't. Uh, the fact is that doing the course made me notice, made me see what had been invisible to me before, because suddenly I had eyes to notice, uh, because I was thinking about it in a way that I never had done before. We need to do that. We need to be alert uh, to the possibility uh, of marriages that are in trouble, uh, of domestic abuse, and indeed of child abuse. If we're thinking about those categories, then we'll ask the question. Uh, what sort of questions might we ask? Uh, well, I think in domestic abuse, uh, it just ask some general questions. Should I be worried about you? Have you ever had a reason to, to feel frightened um, in your relationship? Um, uh, maybe to, to ask people, uh, what's the worst that has happened to you uh, in your relationship? Uh, and know that whatever answer you get to that question will still be considerably less than what has really happened. Uh, even when people are disclosing to you domestic abuse, uh, what they say uh, will be a small percentage of what has really happened. If you find yourself in that context, be careful in communication. Uh, don't assume that uh, emails or texts are private communication uh, with, uh, with the person that you're communicating with. Uh, they will often be being seen uh, by, by partner. So listen uh, for trouble. Um, listen next for anxiety. Uh, 
Uh, I remember early on in, uh, in the pandemic, listening to a government official who was talking about the, uh, the new need for hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. And, and with a little bit of a, a, a sort of smiley face said, I guess we've all got to be a bit OCD now. Um, and I remember as I heard that thinking, I wonder how that sounds to someone who really does have OCD, because that's not a joke to them. Um, how do we speak into the health fears uh, that so many people have at the moment? Um, uh, the experience of obsessive fear and worry um, that is preoccupying uh, people um, in, many, in many circumstances. Uh, th there's lots here, I think, um, and some of it is kind of obvious and some of it sort of less obvious. Um, I think it, in a sense, if we go from the end of the passage towards the beginning, uh, you might first think that um, uh, one of the things that, that Jesus does in that lovely section through uh, 22 through to 34 is, as it were, to, to tell people not to behave like sort of functional orphans, not to behave as if there is no heavenly father taking care of them. It's such a it's such a lovely phrase, David Powlison's phrase, that, you know, don't be functional orphans, don't behave as if you don't have a heavenly father uh, who cares for your needs. Um, uh, and then earlier on in that same section, um, I think rather, uh, rather intriguingly, uh, Jesus uh, seems to be saying, recognize your inability. Since you cannot do this very little thing, verse 26, add even as much as a single hour to your life, why do you worry about the rest? It's fascinating to consider how much of our anxiety is produced by grandiosity, uh, by imagining that we have more control over things that we do, by imagining that we're more capable of solving things than we really are. Um, and that creates anxiety because we're overreaching. We're trying to do more than we're really able to do. Um, but then I think it gets a bit more interesting in the earlier parts of the passage in terms of surprising ways of speaking into anxiety. And I think one of those would be um, worry about some bigger problems. The parable of the rich fool uh, describes uh, the, the awful result of not being rich towards God, um, uh, entering eternity unprepared. Um, and in a funny sort of way, the, the apocalyptic literature, we've just finished a series in Daniel, working our way um, through to the end of the book, through all of that um, sort of challenging apocalyptic material. And I think again and again, facing difficulty apocalyptic literature takes us to the end and tells us that you know things are going to get worse um, before the end comes so get things in proper proportion there are bigger things to worry about than your tiny worries uh, might be one way of approaching this uh, or finally fear god first fear him who has authority to throw you into hell and um, reset perspective uh, see the, the much bigger frame on which your life is being lived uh, and therefore puts, puts your own concerns um, into a different frame of reference. Now, none of that answers the question of how you would go about giving that material over. You need wisdom and pastoral skill and great love. Um, you're not being cross with people for feeling anxious. Um, I don't think that the instruction from Jesus, don't worry, is the same as the instruction, don't lust, uh, as if you're just crossly telling people off. I think that the instruction, don't worry, is more like the way that a parent might run to a child who's woken up screaming in the middle of the light. And you pick the child up, wrap them in your arms and say, don't worry, I'm here. It's all right. I think it's that flavour uh, of, uh, of conversation. So uh, there's four thoughts uh, about um, from Luke 12. Uh, last couple of things, and then we're going to hand over to, to Dan. Um, uh, slightly new thought to me is, is to think, um, should we be at this stage listening for growth and decline? Um, what will the, uh, the, the denial of our, of our routines of community life have done to us? Uh, some, I think, will have grown in strength because they've stopped relying on the others. Others, I think, will have collapsed. Um, I used to work for a, for a boss, Mark Ashton, who said, um, change is never neutral. Change always brings about some kind of transformation, either takes us on spiritually or knocks us back. Um, how will we find out how people are doing? Um, uh, and then finally, listen to yourself. Um, I had a week off a couple of weeks ago, and as I 
took that week off, it dawned on me just how tired I'd become. It was affecting my decision making. Um, it was affecting everything that I was doing. And I hadn't realized just how exhausted I was. I think we muddle, don't we, the categories of being a hero, being a servant and being wise. Oh, we know we're not supposed to try and be heroes, but sometimes being servant-hearted starts to look like that. Uh, we know we're supposed to be wise, uh, but wisdom sometimes doesn't extend to recognizing our own fallibility, our own frailties, and our own finitude. We think we need to be strong, we think we need to be heroes, and the result really isn't very good. Not good for us, uh, not good for others. So, so listen to yourself, ask the same questions of yourself that you might be asking for others. Where is your anxiety? Where is your trouble? Is it your marriage that is struggling at the moment? If so, who are you talking to about that? Who could you talk to about that? Uh, who do you talk to to find out what's written between your lines, uh, the stuff that maybe you're not even aware of? Um, our churches and our ch recent church history is full of enough fallen leaders to warn us not to allow ourselves to go there. Are we ready to seek help before uh, we hit that crisis point? Uh, we know the damage that we will do if we fail uh, to seek help uh, when we need it. So that's a whole string of listening. Um, uh, and just before I finish, uh, I want to speak to those of you who are saying, um, enough now, you're telling me about all this listening. I'm a bit frustrated. I thought we had a gospel to proclaim. Uh, I thought we were supposed to be speakers, not listeners. Um, when exactly do we get to speak? Um, well, I think what I want to say is that you get to speak after you've listened. Um, you see, we don't just speak random words, do we, um, into people's lives. Uh, we speak specific words. And actually, that is what scripture does. Scripture is always intentional. Scripture always has a purpose in mind. Um, it's true of the epistles in the New Testament. Ephesians is doing something different to Galatians. 1 Peter is doing something different to 1 Thessalonians. Why? Because the inspired writers were speaking into a particular context. They knew the situation they were speaking into and they spoke specifically. That's why we need to listen. Uh, if we don't listen, we won't be able to speak a, a God-given and appropriate word to the particular people in front of us. Uh, that's a bit of a whiz through, um, sorry, lots of material in a short space of time. I will stop sharing my screen um, and I think we're going over to Dan now uh, for a little bit from him. Good to be with you guys. Uh, apologies in advance if numbers bring you anxiety. Um, I will try and make it uh, simple and understandable and it'll be useful. Um, some of you will, will be aware and thank you for those of you who took part, but back in the middle of May, um, asked a number of people a number of questions to see really how we as a sort of pastoral community are doing um, in the midst of COVID and of lockdown. Um, I was prompted particularly actually by a suicide of a prominent pastor in the States and just thought I'd, it'd be great to ask how, how folk in the UK particularly are doing. Um, I'm aware that it's subjective it, it, largely and I'm aware that it's a snapshot as well. It was mid-May so it may be that people are doing better now um, it may be that as we've got into those systems and we're kind of getting used to the rhythm and um, things are doing better, it may be that it's worse actually. We're looking at our summer holidays, um, we're realising very little chance for a break. Um, we're fed up with it and we want to be back to kind of what, whatever normal might be. Um, so, uh, sorry, there we go. Um, so top left chart to start off with, we asked, this, this will be just a, a limited number of the questions as well. There's lots of information in there, but just I think what would be most useful for now. Um, we asked pastors, those in pastoral ministry, how often do you want to give up um, on ministry? Uh, from a scale of one to six, so never being a one and six being most weeks, and you can see only 5% said never, but actually over 50% were at two. So most people, some of the time, want to give up on ministry. Perhaps that's not a surprise to you. And perhaps you know your own heart and sometimes that the grass does look greener. Um, why do people want to give up on ministry? Well, top right chart now, the, the blue line at the bottom, again, perhaps unsurprising, the, the weight and responsibility um, that we carry as, as those in pastoral ministry, the, the amount, the nature of, of what's going on and, and what we do. Um, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, 50% of people mention criticism from within the church. Um, it is true that sheep bite, and when sheep bite, it hurts. Um, 
as well as that, the, the slightly more surprising one for me, um, impact on family there as well, but the surprising one was um, issues with other leaders. Um, so conflict perhaps within staff teams, conflicts on elderships, um, conflict with other churches even. And that was kind of 43% of people saying want to leave ministry because of that. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, again, the difficult pastoral things, um, we're not sort of bulletproof. Um, we absorb some of the hard pastoral stuff that people in our church are going through, the, the reality of suffering, the reality of sin. And as we uh, feel that we carry that, then people, again, can want to pull away. Um, as well as that, though, the green line there, lack of growth is interesting too. So things are just slow. And because things are slow, it can be... Um, tempting to think about doing other things you know, we think am i the right person for this job am i even in the right job um even though things are hard though bottom right chart now 62 percent. this was pre-lockdown said no history of mental health issues so that's nearly two-thirds of people um 25 percent say yes and then 14 percent say maybe now watch that and um, watch that maybe as we slip to the next slide um those 14 who said um, maybe a, a history of mental health issues then becomes 39 maybe lockdown is being is detrimental to our mental health and then interestingly as well the 62 percent who said no history of mental health becomes um issues becomes 32 percent um, so as perhaps the reason you're on this call is because you're aware that it's affecting you i think the reality is it's affecting most of us um what did that look like um some words and descriptions from people um, decreased motivation came up quite a lot. Um, mood swings and generally feeling quite low. Uh, a hopelessness, a lethargy, exhaustion, sleeping issues, as um, Steve was just mentioning, tiredness, that anxiety, stress, um, feeling overwhelmed at times, utterly overwhelmed. And then just an inability to cope. How am I going to cope with this? How long is this going to go on? Um, the bottom right slide now, the the fact that we are coping though and the coping mechanisms largely are good um, people are keeping going and they're, they're doing so in helpful ways so we might be isolated physically um, but there's still a desire to open up and um, wanting to be relationally connected so people are coping through opening up to others um, people talked about healthy habits as well i mean how many of you have taken up running or are running more um, or are out walking or just getting away from screens for a time and getting outside um, and having a bit of space. Um, thankfully, there's a, an increase seeking the Lord, an increased prayer as well, sort of 44% or so there. Um, we recognise our weakness. We recognise our inability to control things. We can't do it. And so we're going to him as the one um, whose power is made um, perfect in through our weakness. Um, now, the, the blue line above that is slightly more concerning. That's um, self-medication alcohol seems to be um, on the up consumption of alcohol the news will tell us is, is gone up and that seems to be the case as well with pastors or those in pastoral ministry um the next one though as well the green one for me is is slightly concerning and that's i'm um, asking how are you coping the box that was ticked was no I, i'm just keeping going so th there aren't any of the other things it's just keeping going and a quarter of people saying actually they're just keeping going um, the reason these will be if you um, come to more than 100 percent is because you can have more than one box of course but those who are just keeping going are a quarter the problem there of course um, is that there may well be that the straw that breaks the camel's back and um, things just keep going you keep going you keep going and then suddenly something happens or there's one extra thing and it's, then it's just um, messy um, of course we are isolated and so thinking through a little bit about um, support and uh, indeed support before lockdown as well is I think where we might have some some work to do and some ways that we can be growing and, and helping one another in this um it's striking that to me at least that only a quarter of people say they always have sufficient support um in pastoral ministry and um, that's one in four uh, that means that three quarters don't now there may be some sub subjectivity as to what sufficient support looks like but it's striking to me that only a quarter say they have it um the support comes from, again, top right, so a spouse, primarily, initially, 72, 73% there. Um, those on staff team as well, others in leadership, so maybe um, your staff team, maybe your um, eldership and others that you serve alongside. 
Um, other pastures help too, so the, the grey and the yellow lines. So a fraternal pastor is slightly more at a distance, but local pastors as well. Um, so outside the church, supporting one another. And then nearly 50% as well, say folk from within the church, which as we all know can be fantastic. Um, at times can be complicated though. Um, I was struck by the dark blue mentor. Only just less than 30% of people um, say they had support from a mentor. Um, again, I, I expected that to be higher. I thought there was more of a sort of culture of mentoring. And um, perhaps that's something else to think about. Um, the other slight surprise as well as that, though, is, on, is that only a third of people tell their support everything. Um, which means that we are carrying a lot on our own. Um, different reasons why people didn't tell their support everything. Um, some good reasons, so confidentiality and then... Uh, and, yeah, it's not wise to tell people everything. Um, not wanting to be a burden to others. You know, a problem shared is a problem doubled. Um, and so wanting to protect people um, from some of the, the stresses and the strains that we're carrying. But as well, it'd be fair to say there was a thread, um, a theme through the answers for some, that there's kind of shame. So we don't tell support everything because um, I'm struggling with a particular sin and actually nobody else knows about it or very, very personal things. Um, or, or doubts that we're, we're holding on to, or, or even suicidal thoughts, um, or pornography, things like that. And so that's one of the reasons there's not always the openness um, that we might like or, or expect. Um, final slide, and I, I recognise um, I've been super quick, so please do get in contact if you want to talk more, um, or if there's more helpful ways to sort of analyse the data and things to look at. Um, it's striking to me that there was a fair bit of diversity for those people we spoke to. So I think 76 people on the sample. So it's not a huge sample. It's a slightly blunt instrument, but a relatively diverse bunch. Um, different ages, different length of ministry, different denominations and streams. So about 40% were FIC, um, but actually further afield as well. And different positions as well. So a number of kind of senior pastors, a number of associate or assistant pastors too. But when you ask this question, it was as if people were reading from a script in their answers. Say, so how do you think the wider pastoral community um, can help one another in these things? That was the final question to finish on. Um, and 81% said a change of culture, basically. So a culture that's more gracious, more vulnerable, more honest, and mostly through local gatherings where we can support one another rather than compete with one another. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but just look at the middle one um, for now. Uh, th these are actual answers that people put. So being more open and honest about it. I have no answer to this problem, but I regularly struggle with comparison syndrome, looking at what others are doing and their results and feeling that I'm doing it wrong. I'm not sure how we can help each other with that, really. Well, the bottom right one. Um, be honest and open about our weaknesses, struggles and failures. We try to dismantle the culture whereby when we meet as pastors, it's as if we're competing to show how successful we are. So lots of people talk about a change in the culture among us. Um, and if only a quarter have sufficient support, we'll say they always have sufficient support, then I wonder whether we can begin some of those things now, actually some of the questions that Steve was asking at the end of his session just before. Um, maybe hey, if you can't cope with Zoom, then a phone call or even a socially distanced walk with um, other local pastors, um, people within your kind of locality who you can, who you know a bit, but maybe you can open up to more. Um, maybe longer term, it's taking more responsibility for those other local pastors as well. Maybe it's doing less so that you have space in your diary to prioritise them. Um, saying no to things so you can say yes to them, to encourage them and keep them going hopefully vice versa. And with that as well, it's going to take us to be open and to help change that culture. So, so it's taking off the mask ourselves as you ask that pastor to go for a distance walk, to be brave and say, hey, would you, would you pray for me because I'm, I'm struggling to pray at the moment or I'm finding this lockdown really hard? Or would you pray for me and my, my marriage because my wife and I, we're, we're just bickering a lot and and they didn't seem to go by before we have another argument or something um, to actually create that culture yourself, to be willing and open yourself, um, which then hopefully will spread and hopefully we will be able to um, support each other more. Sorry, that was whistle stop. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, back to John, I think. Thanks so much, Steve and Dan. Phil, um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Is there anything you want to kick us off with?
Yeah, sure. There's a couple come in, uh, John, about lockdown generally, which would be good to get to towards the end. But on specifically what uh, Steve and Dan have been so helpfully sharing with us. Uh, Steve, here's one for you to, to start with. And our culture is now at a point where mental health is being talked about more than ever, but almost to the point where it feels untouchable, perhaps for us as a church. How, how do we balance that when perhaps you've got congregation members saying, well, it's fine for Jesus to tell me not to be anxious, but I've been diagnosed by a doctor, therefore it doesn't same way what, what advice would you give pastorally uh, in that situation steve uh gosh I, I suspect all of these questions are going to be um kind of you know million dollar questions that get a five cent answer to use the american phrase um that um i, I think in, in your own heads or in our own heads if we if we think about psychiatric diagnosis as largely being descriptors rather than explainers, uh, that's, that's helpful. Uh, they're only really describing what's happening. Uh, they're not explaining it. Um, and I think if, if, we, if we feel clearer about that, then it gives us more confidence to say that we're not, you know, we're not trespassing into territory that we shouldn't engage with. Um, another way of thinking about it would be to say, if you had somebody in your congregation diagnosed with a lymphoma, you wouldn't imagine to think, oh, well, I better step back and, and let the medics get on with it. You'd step towards them and say, oh, gosh, you know, th this is a terrible thing. You know, how can I help and support? Well, then think the same way about a mental health diagnosis. Um, it, it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be either or. Um, in fact, you know, all the more reason to be involved um, in that sort of context. I think those, are, th those would be two quick responses. Uh, and just linked to that, Steve, how do we create safe spaces whereby people can be free to talk about the anxiety they're feeling without giving into it becoming an acceptable kind of sinfulness? Um, I, I mean, I think, Dan, I think Dan's comments there towards the end were really helpful, what he, what he picked up from the survey. Um, I mean, it was music to my ears to see that, you know, what people were saying in response to those questions were, we need a culture shift in our churches. Uh, because I believe that passionately. Um, our sort of, you know, you know, British stiff upper lip if you are British, um, and our kind of, you know, emotional reserve, um, all of which means that we, you know, we want to give a facade of everything being all right, and then suddenly we tip over the edge. Um, it's just so unhealthy. Um, and I think being able to, to, to create a greater level of, of honesty is, is just good for us spiritually. Um, because you know our great peril in, in in our churches is that we create communities with a facade of of, of religious self righteousness um, rather than uh, honest communities of sinners uh, struggling uh, with ongoing ongoing battles with sin all in need of grace. Um, those are much more attractive communities um, to the non Christian world uh, gazing in. Um, so we, you know we need to do more of that. Um, and I think I, I, I'm less worried um, that we just that we're all going to become sort of you know self-obsessed navel gazers. I, I think I think that's overblown. Um, I, I think there are some people who are self-obsessed. The the, the the greater bulk of people, I think, need to become a little bit more self-aware. Well, obviously, mental health struggles are are tricky pastoral issues. How can we best approach those who are perhaps we can't see face to face at the moment because they're, they're shielding? How best to engage with those folk? Uh, um, oh gosh, do I, do I have any bright ideas for that? I mean, if, I think, I think maybe frequently and more briefly, um, so that rather than having, you know, kind of, you know, the very occasional, very long conversation over Zoom or the phone, um, you know, touch in more often um, and, and for shorter periods of time, because that'll give you a better, a better sense of trajectory um, if people are declining uh, or if people are going up and down, you'll get, you'll, you'll, get a, you'll get a better picture by more frequent occasional contacts.
That's great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, perhaps this one uh, to, to Dan in the first instance. Dan, you talked a lot about how pastors are feeling. This is a question very much about how pastors look after themselves during this period. And mm-hmm. um, I, I hope that I know that uh, he won't mind me saying but this one's come from Leicester, which is still in lockdown. How do we consider <laughs> kind of taking holiday and breaks and recharging our batteries when we can't really still get a change of scenery and it might be the case for others as well if other local lockdowns come in any any wisdom on that um no not much uh, i i was struck so my, my wife's a medic um and is sort of working in a e at the moment and she, she sent me a podcast that's and it's, it's not a christian podcast but actually doctors talking to each other um, um something it, it, it just slightly something twigged in us and the, the, the one the one application from it a acknowledging we're all finding it hard um that was one thing but then the, the other thing was to um it sounds really stupid but forgive me do something fun every day um there can be that kind of stoic resolve that we just think i'm just going to get through the next day i'm going to get through but if if, if so i'm trying to free her up and say what have you done that's fun today and, and vice versa if we can't take holidays which is looking less likely um, and particularly for some of you guys in Leicester, which I'm super sorry. Um, then actually just making space, and perhaps not trying to do quite as much, to slow the pace down, to look after each other if you're married, and to make sure that you and your spouse each day are doing something that's, that's able to just slightly recharge the batteries. Um, it's not going to be a holiday, it's not going to be two weeks in wherever but just to slow the pace down, to do some of the healthy habits and good things and to make sure that you're looking after each other. Um, Because to be honest, I think we probably, (laughs) so he's not watching this, but we probably were bickering a bit. And it was just at that moment when she suddenly realized, ah, I'm feeling like this. And then I twigged as well. Then, so yeah, not hugely wise, not a Christian podcast, but helpful to see how the doctor community seeking to look after each other. Uh, Steve, you, you've been quoted here. It feels like juggling too many balls while standing on a wobbly raft. I think you went on to say, and you can't see the waves coming, didn't you? Um, pastor's asking here, any tips for avoiding exhaustion? Because that is an exhausting place to be. Well, I, I was just going to um, build on what Dan was saying. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who says, when I, if I'm taking, you know, whether it's a day off or it's a week off, the first few days of coming off email feels like a withdrawal syndrome you know i it it takes a real effort not to to just sort of check in Um, i really have to discipline myself and have to believe that not looking at emails is gradually going to become less stressful and then i'll arrive at the point where actually i think why did i do that so much of the time Um, you know so i think it really is believing um that my day off and and blocking it out um, and stopping um, and just deciding I'm going to read a novel um, and doing the same sort of stuff on holiday is the right thing to do Um, and getting over the hump uh, of actually feeling more stressed by not looking at email. Um, So, sorry, I wasn't there if I was answering your question. I'm sure I was. That's really helpful to me personally, Steve. So I'm sure it's helpful to many of the others on the call as well. So thank you. And um, John, I'm consciously um, all the questions, well, the majority of the questions that have come in for, for Steve and for Dan. I wonder if you want to do some lockdown questions or whether you want to record those separately, brother. It's up to you. Uh, are there many? Uh, we could do a couple, just a couple of minutes if that's helpful. That's fine. So um, one's coming about face masks from a couple of people, John, and it's one that occurred to me as well. With the mandatory uh, guidance from the governments to wear face masks in shops, do you feel that might be extended to places of worship? Uh, I don't honestly know. Um, What the government has said so far is they're not extending that to offices or to pubs or to restaurants. So there's clearly something specific about the shop context and the numbers of people passing through that has caused them to make that decision. So um, there's nothing suggesting that that will be made mandatory in churches, but I think who knows what the government might do as, um, from their perspective, scientific data changes, the risks of COVID develop. Uh, Lots of things seem to suggest that they're worried about a big spike come the autumn. So the last couple of days, there've been lots of stories about significant numbers of deaths, resurgence. It's beginning to happen around the world one wonders if some of this is in anticipation of that. But they have said so far they are not going to make the mandatory in work. It hasn't been extended to pubs and restaurants. 
A uh, question about test and trace, John. Uh, so if churches are keeping people's details for 21 days, if somebody in a church who's attended, gone back to worship, tests positive for coronavirus, does that mean automatically everybody who's attended that day would have to self-isolate? Because that is causing some anxiety for one or two about whether they should reopen at all. Uh, it's a possibility. It depends on how you've observed social distancing uh, with the group that is there. So if the rules have been followed and people have remained only in the, the group that they came with and have not interacted with others, that is all about limiting the amount of scale of um, isolation after test and trades. That's the reason behind the government's message last week about not conversing with others in with other groups, because that's all about being able to say that you haven't had contact with others and that therefore they should also have to isolate. So the answer is it entirely depends on what sort of social contact you will have had. So it's inevitable, isn't it, that if your steward is tested for COVID-19, then that may well have more implications than if it's a person who you're sitting adjacent to, um, uh, than if it's a Sunday school person who's taught your children. I think it's quite complicated and it will depend very much on what mitigations have been in place and the scale of people that you've had contact with while you've been in the worship environment. Uh, John, a church has been in touch asking, uh, they hold an annual conference, can they still go ahead with that with social distancing? It would be more than 30 people, would it be classed as an act of worship under the guidelines or should they be advised not to go ahead with it? Uh, I don't know exactly what the option to that is, I think that the rules are it's not more than 30 people outside, obviously conference venues are making venues available, so I think the key thing would be to check with the venue and to be very clear as to what the social distancing requirements uh, would be for that. It's worth saying that um, obviously a conference of that nature, you are spending significant amount of time with one another and potentially interacting with one another. So I think there must be some concerns about the length of time that people might be spending um, with one another and whether they're connecting with the whole group that would be there rather than remaining with a relatively small group but I would say primarily speak to the people who are providing the venue as to what what is allowed there. Uh, final one John which is a nice one to finish with I think I'm going to read it as it was written because it's a great uh, phrasing uh, lockdown magnifies the two extremes of the Pharisee and the careless sinner as we respond to reopening so how do we help both groups deal with the tensions of returning to a more normal life? OK, um, I think worth just recognising that they are there. I think that's a good observation that, that they are um, uh, kind of there. Um, it depends really what you see as the Pharisee. Um, so in the Bible, the Pharisees are meticulous about some laws, but basically are avoiding the big thing of the law. So there's an irony that the Pharisee and the careless person are actually very similar biblically in that they're both actually ignoring the big demands of God so that the Pharisee is only concerned about the um, externals, not the really big issues of justice and the heart. The careless sinner isn't concerned at all. So I wouldn't say don't draw too big a wedge between them. In our church context, given this webinar, it might be better to think in terms of the person who is fearful and the person who is confident, um, that maybe those differences are often bound up with whether you think there's a real risk or not and therefore the degree to which the guidance should be followed in full, and the degree to which we should think about setting the guidance away. I think as church leaders, you've got to set the tone, and therefore probably you shouldn't fall in either camp, no matter what your personal opinions are. So whatever your personal opinions about the lockdown, about the guidance, about the virus, I don't think you should be leading out of your personal opinions. You should be leading out of what is right in the context uh, in which we face. And um, just constant explanation of what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's important for the benefit of the body as a whole. You're really negotiating the relationship between the weak and the strong as to how they address this issue. And as I said in some very early webinars, maintaining the unity of the body with that diversity of natural feeling is a hugely important part of our leadership. Phil, thank you so much for taking us through those questions. Um, can I say on all of you, your behalf, a huge thank you to um, Steve and for Dan for uh, sharing with us. Um, there are some more resources that will be um, uh, sort of available on a resource sheet.
please do check into the BC UK website. Um, uh, there's the sort of information you can find out more about their work and their ministry there, but that has been hugely helpful uh, to us. As I said, we're back next Wednesday thinking about youth and children's. This um, webinar will be available um, up online as soon as we can possibly make it. Let me pray for us as we finish. Those words from um, Luke uh, 2. Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Father, we thank you and praise you for that wonderful reminder that we are not orphans because we have you, a loving heavenly father, and that you know our needs. Forgive us when we lack faith and we function as if we are orphans. When we forget that you will provide, when we forget that you know, when we feel that the burden ought to fall on us, please help us not to be those who are proud, not those who think that we have to um, uh, solve everything, but may we instead trust in you and your good provision. And thank you for that reminder from Dan of just the struggles that pastors are facing. We want to ask and pray that we would support and encourage one another. We pray for any who are in danger because they're simply self-medicating, falling into alcohol or falling into sin. Might you have mercy? Might you help us to be concerned for one another's walk with the Lord Jesus? Please help us to foster that new culture of genuine openness and loving support. So thank you for what we've heard. Please would we go uh, sort of uh, back to be serving in our churches with a renewed confidence in the gospel we have to share and apply. Give us those listening ears and please would you help us to care for ourselves. In Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>